Here we're going to apply molecular orbital theory to the simplest molecule possible, the H2 plus ion. The H2 plus ion will be just a, uh, a two protons, one for each H and H2. So this would be a positively charged proton. This is H, uh, let's call this the first atom. Over here you have another positive charge and that's the proton on the hydrogen atom of the second electron, uh, second uh, nucleus, second hydrogen atom, and then you just have one electron here and it sees the positive charge from both nuclei. If you make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation where these two nuclei are stationary and you can then solve that exactly. So that's exactly what you do. It's a single electron. So when you set up the Schrodinger equation, you can solve it exactly because it's a single electron. And as we said, when you looked at the hydrogen atom for a single electron, we could solve that. Same way with the H2 molecule, single electron, we can solve that exactly uh, using the Schrodinger equation. Again, we have to make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Recall that's where the nuclei remain stationary and the electron moves, so there's no kinetic energy of the nuclei you have to worry about. That's usually a good assumption because nuclei are generally at least 1,836 times the mass of the electron, so it moves much more slowly. The mass of the proton is 1,836 times the mass of an electron. And now if you put more, uh, go up the periodic table, the nuclei get even heavier. Uh, you can, uh, with a Born-Oppenheimer approximation, you separate out the energy of the nuclei and so on, and so you just have out, have an electronic Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian for just that one electron. And then if you look at here, uh, when we just had an H atom, we had this and this and this going around here, so we thought, oh, maybe we could use spherical coordinates, and indeed we could, and that allowed us to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, in terms of separation of variables and get a simple term for energy and fairly simple um, expressions for um, wave functions, depending on how you <laughs> define simple. But now that spherical coordinate system is not going to work very well here because, if anything, this is going to trace around, say, an ellipse. So the electron will zip around here uh, in an ellipse. So we don't want to use spherical coordinates. In fact, we want to use ellipsoid coordinates or prolate spheroidic spheroidal coordinates. What does that mean? A prolate spheroid means if you take an ellipse like this and then rotate it, so this would be coming towards you, this would be going away from you, and you rotate it, you would get a cigar-shaped uh, three-dimensional structure, and that would be a prolate ellipsoid. So anyway, and that those coordinates, um, we won't go through that in detail, you can look that up online, but uh, this say is R1, the distance of the electron from the first nucleus. This will be R2, that's the distance of the electron from the second nucleus, and then there's another uh, parameter, another distance here, r, which is the distance between the two nuclei. Now r doesn't change with time because we have made the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. These nuclei are stationary. So we just have to worry about the electron moving in the stationary charges here. So we just have one kinetic energy term in the Hamiltonian. Here it is. This is the uh, kinetic energy term for that one electron moving around. Now we have two um, terms dealing with the uh, electron nuclear attraction. So one here, that's that R1 distance, and there's another attraction between this other nucleus, that's the R2 direction, so it's e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And then, and that's an attractive because you have the negative positives, that goes in as a negative. But now here, this third term in the Hamiltonian, this is the electron, electron, or sorry, the proton, proton repulsion 
it comes in as a positive sign because even though these are not moving, nonetheless there's a repulsion between the two positive charges of these two nuclei and uh, that will give rise to um, a total energy, uh, although it doesn't change with time, it's just a potential energy. And note how we parameterize this as R. R is a constant because of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, but R will change as we change the distance between the nuclei, so that'll be a parameter. All right, so that's our setup. We go ahead. I won't go through the details. Uh, you could probably find that online. You probably find anything online nowadays, uh, and we'll just give the results. So what you find is here's the results. This is just the energies, uh, and then we'll talk about the um, uh, the wave function in just a minute. The energies depend upon internuclear separation. So here's that term R. R was the distance between the two nuclei and you calculate the energy as a function of that parameter r and you get let's look at the red line first you get something that decreases so when r is very when r is very small you have you know the protons almost on top of one another that's a very high repulsion uh, so that the energy goes very high up very steeply when r becomes very small but then if you start moving the two protons away and solve the Schrodinger equation for each one of those distances what you find is that the energy drops and keeps dropping and then it reaches a minimum and now you're pulling the uh, protons further and further away past that minimum distance and the energy starts to go back up again all right so what does that mean? You would say, one would say, well, why don't I change the ink color here to, uh, so I can actually write it here. This distance here, where you have a minimum bond energy, or sorry, minimum energy of that system, this would be called, what do you think? That would be called the bond length. So the bond length, the so-called bond length, is the energy at which this system for the H2 plus uh, molecule, what the energy of the system is at a minimum. So there it is. And of course, uh, using the harmonic oscillator approximation, these two protons can oscillate back and forth with one another. And so that's that oscillation right here. And we'll model this later on as a harmonic oscillator. But there it is, the bond length, and then it goes back up again. So it turns out there's a, a sweet spot right here where the distance between the two nuclei is just right to give a minimum energy and that'll be the bond, we'll call that the bond distance. Then it also turns out that you get energies, um, if you do molecular orbital theory, typically you get more just like you did for the atoms, you get more than one wave function to solve the Schrodinger equation. Same way with molecules, you get more than one wave function and some of those wave functions look like this, like this green dotted line here this green dotted line there's no minimum in energy it just keeps going down and down and down and eventually out here is where you completely pull the protons away and the electron is either on one or the other this is called an unbound state it's unbound because it doesn't have this minimum in energy which you normally would say there's a bond length so there's no bond length here so there's unbound states also so these things you don't get when you talk about valence bond theory in valence bond theory you just have a bond being formed. Uh, there's no such thing as unbound states. Okay, so uh, let's look at the wave functions. Here are the first, uh, the lowest energy wave function. This is the next higher energy wave function. The lowest energy, we'll learn what these symbols mean in a, in a while, but the lowest energy is one where the electron, this by the way is the plot of the wave function just by itself, plotted at a, a constant value around the center of the system here. So this is the wave function. So there it is. Uh, that's the wave function, lowest energy. Now when you go to the next higher one, you get this interesting uh, wave function here. So this is positive. This is negative. So the wave function goes from a positive to a negative value here. And there's a nodal plane right in between uh, the atoms. So nodal plane means there's no electron density. So here you have electron density between the two atoms, yeah, you're happy, but then when you go to this next higher energy orbital, you have no electron density. In fact, there's a nodal plane. This is called an anti-bonding orbital. All right, so maybe you've uh, heard of those, anti-bonding orbitals. Well, that's what they are. They're solutions of the Schrodinger equation in which you have a nodal plane. This is now an anti-bonding 
orbital. All right, antibonding orbitals. Antibonding orbitals, or what they're called, antibonding orbitals, is something that you do not get in the valence bond or the hybridization valence bond theory that comes out of molecular orbitals. So there you have it, the H2 plus, the two new things you get are these bound states uh, where you have a minimum energy and you call that the bond length and you have these unbound states and then you have uh, bonding and antibonding orbitals. That's what comes out of molecular orbital theory when applied to the H2 plus, at, uh, H2 plus molecule.